I'm your host, Maya Rocky Moore. Well, there was a digital march on Washington this week in response to President Obama's newly unveiled 2014 uh, proposed budget. Uh, that budget contains a controversial $1 trillion plus in additional spending cuts uh, on top of the $1.9 trillion that he's already accepted and signed into law uh, in previous iterations. So among the president's proposals, just as a reminder to our listening audience, is $400 billion in cuts to Medicare, some of which hit beneficiaries directly, and another $130 billion in cuts to Social Security through uh, the implementation of a provision called the CHAIN CPI, which would basically make uh, the cost of living adjustment that all uh, people who are receiving benefits issued by the federal government uh, receive annually, it make it stingier. Uh, the CHAIN CPI actually makes the cost of living adjustment stingier over time. And so um, this is a measure that there has been a a hot reaction. This digital march on Washington was a result of a lot of groups coming together. Uh, Peter, can you tell us, I think you were involved in this, weren't you? Yes, um, We Act Radio actually did the live stream, which I think 26 or something thousand people have watched at this point. Um, it was great. It was about, you know, I think 10 or 12 at least organizations, fielded people out there, um, National Committee to Sur Preserve Social Security Medicare, sponsor the show, move on. Um, National Organization of Women, like a lot of groups that- AFL-CIO. AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. exactly. People that you wouldn't always expect to sign on to a very specific thing like this are all like, this is not a good idea. So so, you know, a lot of people in, uh, you know, outside of Washington would wonder, well, how did you know? Because you actually did this on Tuesday and the budget was released on Wednesday. How did you know and how did you manage to collect those sig signatures in time uh, to release it before the budget? Yeah, so um, the president's um, people started leaking that the change to be in the budget, I think, last Thursday night. Um, by Friday, um, people were already mobilizing, like, full steam ahead. Mm -hmm. So. Social Security Works and the National Committee um, put together this thing where they got all these organizations to ask their membership to sign a petition against the change CPI, which they deliver on Tuesday, the day before the budget. So it was a right. really great example of how progressives have a real knack for rapid response right now. Mm -hmm. Two million signatures. Uh, this, these are digital signatures through petitions. Mm -hmm. Two million, which was more than I understand the Fix the Debt Coalition was able to get. Well more. I think they've got about 350,000 over the course of like four months now. And let me remind our listening audience that the Fix the Debt Coalition are the nation's CEOs uh, who are actually organizing themselves uh, to cut your Social Security and Medicare benefits. Uh, and of course, the Business Roundtable we talked about has also uh, introduced a proposal to cut Social Security and Medicare benefits. Even some of those companies that don't offer uh, benefits uh, for their employees uh, are proposing to cut Social Security and Medicare. We are in some very, very interesting times, to say the least. It's surprising, too, because like Walmart and other employers want, you know, they really, really, really want the state, federal, and local governments to support their employees through food stamps, through, you know, paying for their health care, through ER visits. But then they want to actually cut those programs at the same time. Well, th the thing about the difference between Social Security and Medicare and the programs you just mentioned are that Social Security and Medicare are largely paid for by workers themselves. And so you would think that uh, employers would have a different orientation. But back to the White House, please tell me what the reaction, how, when you delivered the petitions, were this, was there any official response from the White House? Um, a little bit. They came out to the gate and met um, a contingent, including Max Richmond from National Committee. And they were like, thank you very much. We'll like consider what we're saying. I think Max said some good stuff, though. We should play a clip from him. Is there any clip? A uh, Max Richmond was uh, out there. Tomorrow is mm -hmm. going to submit a budget that will, in effect, cut Social Security, cut veterans' benefits, cut uh, military civilian retirees, cut ben cut benefits for people with disabilities. We are here today because one week, one week, the Tuesday after the election, we met a group of us, maybe eight or ten, met with the president, the vice president, the secretary of the treasury, in this building behind me. And he agreed Social Security should not be part of any deficit reduction plan. So what's happened? The proposal out there from the White House is to cut the cost of living adjustment. Now, anybody here believe that the COLA you get now is too much? The chain CPI is even stingier. It's the wrong thing to do. 
Sounds like the president went back on his word, and a lot of advocates are actually very upset with him uh, for doing so. Uh, let's remind our listening audience uh, what the chain CPI uh, does. I think Max talked about um, cutting benefits for disability recipients, survivor. Orphans orphans, people whose parent uh, has passed away and left dependent children behind. These are single family households that are on a fixed income in addition to seniors. So we're not just talking about seniors here. We're also talking about veterans Mm -hmm. uh, who have earned their benefits and and those being cut over time. So there are a lot of people that are going to be affected by this. Uh, But what do we know about the public? Uh, The public does not support the chain CPI. Is that correct? Not at all. So ARP, who was also part of the um, action from the White House on Tuesday, Tuesday, mm. had a poll in the field literally at the perfect time here. And they were talking about voters 50 and older, who's like their wheelhouse. And so seven out of 10 of them opposed changing the cost of living adjustment at all for anyone. Seven out of 10. Seven out of 10. Was there a partisan split to that? Um, a little bit. So 75% of Democrats, 63% of Republicans, and 69% of independents. So it's a little mm. like there's a few Republicans out there that are like, yeah, we got to do this. I'm, I've bought the deficit Kool Aid basically. And, but really, like across the line, there are people who are against it. And 80% of people, which has no difference across the board really, um, oppose it for the retired, and not retired, but oppose it for disabled people and veterans. Wow, so that's amazing. We have yet again a disconnect between Washington policymakers uh, and the American public, with the American public overwhelmingly against cuts to Social Security, uh, and this specifically this chain CPI proposal uh, in this particular poll, and yet you see them offering it nonetheless. Mm-hmm. By the way, and we will be talking about this more with our exciting lineup of guests as we talk further uh, down the, in the show with some experts on this issue, but but by the way, I mean, this is something that, uh, you know, certainly that uh, Social Security advocates have been fighting against for a long time uh, and deservedly so. Uh, but there are things, other things that can be done to strengthen Social Security over the long haul. So with that, uh, we have an exciting lineup that includes Craig Gurion. He is the editor of Remapping Debate. He's going to talk about a very interesting study that they did uh, with senators uh, in the Congress uh, where they basically said, look, you you know, there are other ways to strengthen Social Security. How come you're not talking about these other ways? Why are you only talking about cutting benefits? We're going to talk to Bob Seska, uh, who is the host of the Bubble Genius with Bob and Shay show on We Act Radio. Travis Waldron, a reporter blogger for thinkprogress.org and the Center for American Progress Action Fund. And we'll have Gaius Publius again. He is a contributing editor at americablog.com and a professional writer and political observer. Mark Ames, founder uh, of Exile Online com and senior editor of nfsw.com and uh, certainly uh, Yasha Levine who is his co-author on a recent piece talking about the hypocrisy of uh, the Koch brothers and the libertarian right so uh, there is an exciting show today we're going to be talking about getting into further uh, this question about why we're talking about cutting benefits to close a deficit by the way that was created for and by the wealthy did not uh, benefit the majority of the American people, and yet they're trying to now balance the deficit, close the deficit in the long-term debt on the backs of low-income, middle-class, seniors, orphans, disabled individuals. This is this is, I think, hypocrisy and certainly uh, a concern at its highest uh, extreme. Craig, are you with us? I am. The editor of Remapping Debate, also the executive director of the Anti-Discrimination Center and an adjunct professor of law at Fordham Law School. Welcome, Craig. Um, Thanks very much. Uh, Pleased to join you today. So your remapping debate uh, did a study on Capitol Hill. Tell us what you were seeking to achieve. Well, it's really very, very basic reporting. Um, One thing that's known is that um, there are ways that can get rid of any long-term concerns about Social Security solvency. There are, as you know, no short-term concerns about that. And that has to do with the payroll tax. Um, Everybody with a job pays payroll tax, Social Security tax, but once you earn a lot of money, you stop paying the tax. And that number is $113,600 annually. If you earn above that, you're not paying Social Security payroll taxes. Many people don't know that. Right. It's, um, and it's, you, you, 
pay you pay zip beyond that hundred and thirteen thousand in change point. So it's set up right now um, in the most regressive way possible. And the question, what would happen if you narrowed it or eliminated that exclusion of higher income is one that's been studied by the Social Security Administration. And there are different proposals depending on whether it's a narrowing of it, whether you get rid of it uh, completely, whether you get rid of it over $250,000. But in any event, all of that would guarantee any of those things would guarantee long-term solvency for decades. That's right. So um, one of the things that puzzled us at remappingdebate.org was how come we don't read anything about that? How come senators aren't being asked about that? And so uh, what we decided to do, um, we had our reporter, Samantha Cook, go to every single Democratic senator, Democratic and independent senator, okay. who hadn't sponsored or co-sponsored a bill to narrow or eliminate the payroll tax cap. And so there are only about 10 Democrats who are on board with that. Okay. So, Which is shocking, by the way. Right. So, well, mm-hmm. so, what, like, so there are dozens more. What about them? Mm-hmm. And we had, again, very, very basic questions. Does the senator dispute the studies that I just described? Does the senator support any increase in the wages subject to payroll tax? And a couple other questions along those lines. And for the most part, we got either senators who dodged the question, who chose not to comment, who said we're too busy, we can't do it, or just didn't respond whatsoever. Now, I should be clear, it's not like Samantha called at 4.30 in the afternoon for a 5 o'clock deadline Mm -hmm. and said, oops, we didn't get anything, Um, I'm going to write that. No, she wound up doing this over the course of about 10 days and called and emailed each senator five, six, seven, eight Mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. And they just wouldn't say where they were at. Now, it is absolutely the case, and we're doing this as a reporting piece, not an advocacy piece. Mm -hmm. You know, people were entirely free to say, we disagree with raising it for X, Y, or Z reason. Mm -hmm. But they just continued, except for a very small handful, continued to hide. And I think... A tremendous problem is that they're used to being able to hide and get away with it. So the article we wrote, Mm -hmm. which documented just who it was who didn't talk and what flavor of excuse that they gave, that's something that usually doesn't get reported, and we think that it does have to be reported. There were some surprising names on there. Uh, Senator Tim Kaine. Uh, Frank Lautenberg, uh, Barbara Mikulski, uh, Elizabeth Warren. I mean, can you give us a sense of the, the nature of the avoidance and, and why some of those names are on there? Um, right. Well, um, Senator Kane actually was a, a straddler, uh, uh, so he said he was open to uh, raising the tax. Uh, Senator Mikulski's office... Uh, sent back a statement, and usually the, what happens is reporters just will recite what the politician said, but um, she just did her talking points, but mm-hmm. didn't uh, answer it. And there are a lot like uh, Senator Schumer's off, uh, office, where one Which, staffer, by the way, never met a reporter whom they didn't like. Yeah, right. Well, it turns out that uh, one staffer in his office told us that uh, they'd pass along the message, but 99% of the time, media requests are not answered. So, um, And Dick Durbin, by the way, because, you know, he's got a proposal out there to actually create a commission to look at changes to Social Security. 
uh, Dick Durbin didn't respond at all. That that's exactly yeah. that's exactly that's exactly um, right. Maria Cantwell didn't respond. I mean, it's a very very big group who who wasn't uh, answering. So there's the lack of accountability on the part of the senators on something that's really a fundamental issue because what's being talked about here again whether or not it's ultimately a good idea this is a proposal that would mean no cuts in benefits right no raising the retirement age it's clearly important um to the American people. And it's a proposal, by the way, that would, um, you know, levy uh, more taxes on uh, the very individuals who have been getting most of the wealth in this nation over the last three decades or so. Uh, Dean Baker makes the argument that uh, that over 50 percent of the long term shortfall under Social Security is a result is a, as a result of the fact that you have unearned income and other wealth uh, higher than that uh, cap uh, that has accrued to a smaller and smaller number of people while the wages are stagnated for the rest of America. And so you can actually point to wealth inequality as a reason why the Social Security trust funds are actually becoming uh, worsened over time. Uh, and, th- mm-hmm. and there's, in terms of the general federal budget deficit, of which Social Security is not, not a, a part, part of, uh-huh. the, there's a lower tax rate on capital gains income than there is on That's right. earned income. So those things have a cumulative effect. But remember, here again, you mentioned a little earlier in the show this disjunction between the public view and the elite view. Right. On this issue, um, polling has uh, shown that 68% of Americans favor removing the cap. Right. And yet you have reporters, let's say uh, Jackie Combs from the New York Times, Mm -hmm. whose starting point is that cuts are needed. Mm -hmm. If your starting point is cuts are needed, the questions you ask are, how do we do it? Right. Can we get bipartisan agreement on the mature, the reasoned approach to make all of you cut back. Right. Uh, So she's bought into the frame. So people have to be aware uh, that mainstream journalists, and I think, I don't know, I think many of them don't understand, either they don't understand or they're, they're paid not to understand. Uh, that in a, you know cuts is only one frame. Uh, raising revenue in Social Security is another frame, uh, or some mix of that. Uh, but raising revenue is a perfectly legitimate alternative. And and it's it's not just a legitimate alternative. It's a newsworthy alternative. I mean, right. the news is that there's a choice that's out there that wouldn't be a cut, either in benefits or in terms of when you could get your benefits, right. and that so many senators aren't doing that. I think that many mainstream reporters, virtually every mainstream reporter, would say, look, you only have 10 people on the bill. It's not going to pass. Right. Um, so well, my last question for you, because we're out of time, uh, is, you know, what... Why do you think there was so much avoidance? Uh, do you think that they were caught flat-footed, or do you think that they don't want to go on the record uh, as as being for anything that would actually uh, is close Social Security solvency? What, why do you think the response was the way it was? I I think I think that um, politicians, uh, Republicans and Democrats, are used to trying to skirt issues as much as possible. And I think that, in fact, uh, there are more Democratic senators who would ultimately support at least a narrowing of the cap, but they feel they're operating in an environment where they're going to be tagged as this tax and spender and are uncomfortable in doing it. So I do think that the press role is extremely important at remapping debate. We think, let's ask about alternatives and we think that our colleagues should be asking this question of senators 
until they're all on the record. That's right. Well, thank you so much for leading the way uh, at remapping the debate. I think that you've asked the critical question, a question that the New York Times should be asking, a question that the Washington Post should be asking, and yet they're not. And they're not for a reason. So remapping the debate, debate, the debate is remapping actually de- remapping debate. You, I'm, yeah. I'll just take a second of your time. It's remappingdebate.org, and we're going to keep on asking those questions. Thank we hope you. that more people will too. Thanks for joining us, Craig. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> You're listening to Pivot Point with Maya Rocky Moore, sponsored by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. We'll be right back after the break. <laughs> Remapping the debate, remapping the debate. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Social Security and Medicare. These programs touch the lives of virtually every American family. Yet with so much misinformation out there, Americans are pretty confused about their future. You deserve the truth. For more than 30 years, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare has been leading the fight to preserve our nation's most successful programs. Join us and find out how to keep Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid strong for all generations. Learn more online at thetruthnow.org. This is John Bauman. You know me best as Bowser, formerly of the group Sha Na Na. But these days, I'm rocking and rolling nationwide as part of the Truth Tour with the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Some politicians claim they want to protect Medicare, but the truth is they support the Romney Ryan Coupon Care Plan, which would end traditional Medicare. This could raise our health care costs as much as $500 more each month. Ending Medicare doesn't protect it. Learn the facts and join our national campaign at thetruthnow.org. Welcome back to Pivot Point. I'm your host, Maya Rockymore, uh, and I'm very pleased that we're joined by Bob Seska. He is the host of a, a show here on We Act Radio called The Bob and Che Show, and he's also a regular contributor to The Huffington Post. Welcome, Bob. Hi. Hi, Maya. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. You had an article this week called, uh, The President's Social Security Plan is a Really, Really Bad Idea. Uh, can you tell us about the five myths that you highlight in that article? Oh, boy. Well, um, there are so many of them, it was difficult to narrow them to five, but mm-hmm. I, I tried. Um, well, I think the first one is that Social Security is broke. I mean, you see right. these alarmist headlines all over the, the mainstream press, uh, especially in newspapers. Strangely enough, the Washington Post uh, right. and the Washington Post editorial board loves playing up this myth as well. Right. And, you know, the, the serious people in, in Congress uh, t- tend to uh, repeat it a lot. Um, it's not. It's not going broke at all. In fact, um, you know, the, according to the latest trustees report, Social Security will run a surplus uh, for the next two decades. That's I right. mean, until 2033, if they do nothing to, uh, to further the solvency of Social Security, nothing, no legislation whatsoever, still be able to pay full benefits through 2033. But Bob... And even then... After that, it'll last even longer. But, Bob, you know, how is that possible? Because we hear in the news every day that Social Security cuts are needed because we need to close the deficit. Can you tell us about your second myth? Yeah, well, the the deficit is, uh, well, first of all, Social Security isn't part of the deficit. All Secondly, right, let's unpack that. Yeah, well, the, uh, but the other side of it is there's this ongoing myth, and this is something I write about quite extensively, that the deficit is increasing, that the deficit is going up. And what you typically see are a lot of people who, um, I don't know if it's deliberate or if it's intentional, but what they do is they tend to conflict the deficit and the national debt. Mm -hmm. And they see the national debt going up, so therefore the national federal budget deficit must be going up too. But that's not true either, which is, which, you know, the, the actual, the federal budget deficit has actually gone down by uh, almost $500 billion uh, since 2009. And uh, it's, it's projected to go down even further by 2016. 
So, you know, this is not a crisis. We, you know, the, 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 the budget hawks right now really don't have a leg to stand on because the deficit is decreasing and it's going to keep decreasing. Um, and uh, I, I'm not exactly sure why we have to keep cutting programs and, and meddling with Social Security with regards to something that doesn't even exist. Well, the fact of the matter is, you've already mentioned it, if we've got, uh, you know, Social Security has a surplus, then how can it be contributing to the deficit? Uh, not only that, but Social Security is by law not allowed to contribute to the on-budget uh, uh, deficit uh, and long-term right. debt. So with that, people need to understand that uh, that there's a bait and switch going on here. Uh, the public is being uh, sold a bill of goods and being misinformed with regards to Social Security's role because it does not have one in contributing to the deficit uh, or right. uh, the long-term debt. Uh, Social Security itself, as a tight package program, uh, is fully solvent for the next two decades. And even after that, as uh, our guest has mentioned, uh, it can pay 75% on every dollar of promised benefits. But what we need to do to make sure that Social Security is good over the long haul is lift the cap, right? But are they talking about lifting the cap? Not at all. Not at all. They're not, not talking about lifting the cap. They're not in talking about increasing the payroll tax. Right. And these are two things that they could do sensibly, that they could stagger in over time, that would uh, would create long-term longevity for the, uh, for the Social Security program. Uh, I mean, if they were to actually entirely eliminate the income cap on the payroll tax, Social Security would be entirely solvent through 2087. And people I mean, don't understand that. Yeah, that if yeah. you just raise the cap uh, by taking off that uh, cap on uh, the, the $113,600 a year and saying that all people should pay Social Security payroll taxes on all of their uh, earned income, and there are even some people arguing on unearned income, but that's another story. Uh, that you actually get rid of Social Security's long-term solvency gap, and you actually also, uh, depending on the package, raise enough money to also strengthen benefits for the vulnerable populations. That's exactly right. And we're really only talking about a 3% tax increase on people earning more than $113,000, uh, you know, in terms of the rest of their income. Certainly the first 113 is taxed, but, you know, we're talking about taxing the, the entire income. And when you get up into the millionaire, billionaire range, I'm not sure that that's quite a burden on them. So, Bob, given everything that you've just uh, listed, why did the president introduce the chain CPI this past week as a part of his 2014 budget, which is a cut I, in Social Security benefits? Yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I wish I knew. I, I think I... And it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, as I said at the, at the, at the top of uh, this, this conversation, there are a lot of really serious people, or at least they consider themselves to be serious, who think it's, uh, you know, it, it's the, the sign of strong leadership to make these tough choices, right. to sacrifice, and, and, and everyone has to pitch in to help the long-term uh, survivability of Social Security. And I, I think that's that's a false assumption and that's based on all of these well actually they're not even making that argument they're making the argument that everybody has to pitch in to uh, close the long term the, the deficit and the long term debt uh, which by the way you know um, you know the folks on fixed incomes receiving social security benefits did not contribute to so basically they're asking uh, seniors, uh, orphans, uh, people with disabilities, veterans, uh, to actually close uh, the deficit and, and the debt, and which is an interesting, interesting approach, uh, given that we have a Democratic president and we have uh, certainly a Democratic Senate. Did we lose Bob? Bob is not there, uh, so unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to move on. Uh, with that, I think that Bob has made a very important point at the very end of his article uh, that suggests that uh, with the introduction of the chain CPI, uh, the president actually um, set Social Security up for other cuts uh, by uh, feeding into the panic mongering, by feeding into the misinformation. Bob, are you back? Bob, are you back? <laughs> So um, with that, uh, I think that it was a great article, and we appreciated Bob's contribution uh, to that. And if I don't have him back, we're going to go ahead and go to break uh, and come right back with a lineup that includes... Is Bob back? He's not back on my line. 
I can hear you. Oh, you can hear ear. me. Now I can hear yeah, you. Wonderful. Go. Thank you. Um, basically, yeah, as, soon as, say, as soon as I start to attack the, uh, the D.C. elites, my phone mysteriously goes mysteriously down. Mysteriously goes down. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's not get into conspiracy theories here. Uh, so you end that article by saying that the president's move has actually contributed to those who want to destroy Social Security. Uh, lends credence to their arguments. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, on a couple of fronts, I think primarily when we have uh, future Republican President X, whoever that might be, they now have the tacit endorsement of uh, former Democratic President Barack Obama when they want to start uh, tinkering with Social Security and especially cutting benefits. And the That's Republican right. goal, of course, is to kill Social Security by a thousand cuts, to right. slowly make it completely impractical, to raise benefits, get it to the point where people actually want to get rid of it or they want to privatize it because mm -hmm. the actual federal program becomes so ineffectual and that's right. i think that's the that's the process of sabotage that they're engaging in and i think the president has uh, inadvertently i think played into that entire process do you think it's inadvertent or do you think that he is a new democrat that actually um believes uh that quote unquote entitlement programs should be uh cut i think he believes that this is a a sensible way to help Social Security along. I mean, it's got the endorsement of the CBPP and the Center for American Progress and all these things. I'm talking about chain CPI. So it does have the, the, uh, the backing of some liberal organizations, but I, I think so. He feels as if that's kind of a solid ground for him to stand on. Of course, it's, you know, as we said, it's based on numerous myths and a lot of goading by people who are simply concern trolling Social Security in order to get rid of it. What's so interesting sure. is in, in the progressive constellation of organizations that operate in and around Washington, that's basically two organizations out of, uh, you know, <laughs> many <laughs> dozens of other uh, progressive organizations that are against the chain CPI. Uh, yet you, ha you point to those two and, and people are saying that it's okay to endorse this cut to benefits just because two organizations support it. Yeah. So I think and that there's something kind of, else going on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little nefarious, and I don't want to attribute necessarily a conspiratorial motives to the president, but, uh, you know, with something that's called chained CPI, mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't going to really gather what that is. And it's, right. it's extraordinarily difficult to grasp. I mean, you have to kind of look at the details a few times to figure out why it's a cut, but it is a cut. Right. And But I think, you know, in sort of common discussion, I don't think a lot of people are sitting around, you know, a, a bar at the bowling alley saying, oh, that changed CPI. They're screwing us all. Uh, you know, right. I don't think that's happening. I think a lot of people don't understand it and therefore won't really put up much of a fuss. Well, actually, I mean, polling by AARP shows that the vast majority of the American people are actually against it. Once it's explained to them, they're absolutely against it. That's so, right. Bob, thank you so much for coming on today. Appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. Sorry about the call. No problem. Look forward to having you on again, again in the future. Bye-bye. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, also welcoming Travis Waldron of Think Progress uh, to the show. Uh, Travis is actually with the Center for American Progress, one of the uh, quote-unquote liberal organizations who actually does support the chain CPI. Uh, and so with that, um, uh, Travis, are you with us? I am. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Tell us about why you think President Obama introduced this chain CPI proposal as a part of his budget and why the Center for American Progress actually supports that proposal. Uh, well, I think the president uh, was, was pretty clear in why he did it. He's, he's reintroducing the plan he put forth in December that's trying to foster a compromise on a, on a bigger budget deal with the Republicans. So he's he's looking for things that, you know, might get them to the table to talk for a, a longer term deal. That strategy or, or whatnot can be debated on its merits alone. Uh, as far as cap, well, and the, well, actually, before you go there, let it, let us do debate it on its merits. Uh, is okay. it meritorious? Because remember, he's already given away 1.9 trillion uh, in cuts already, uh, and then he's proposing an additional trillion plus in this in this proposed budget. There are some arguing that the president is either a really, really bad negotiator uh, or he's uh, being duplicitous with the American people and is actually in line with this whole notion of cutting uh, benefits to Social Security and Medicare. Well, I think it's kind of a separate debate, for one. I think first you have to look at 
you know where we've where we've been in the past on these debates, where we're we're looking at revenues versus spending cuts. Uh, I don't think there's anyone on the left that would argue that the the deals have been balanced to this point. They um, have they're not. Three and a half, four to one spending cuts to revenues, and, and that's not obviously not a balanced plan. It needs to be much more clo- much closer to one to one or two to one as he as he is seeking. Uh, uh, so I think in terms of whether the president wants to cut Social Security or, or Medicare, as senior, senior officials have said repeatedly that he doesn't, that he's, he's looking for a compromise here and trying to bring Republicans to the table to talk about uh, longer-term plans to get the budget negoci- negotiations out of the way, that something that includes more revenues, includes stimulus, includes uh, better spending cuts that aren't uh, related to sequestration and hitting every program across the board. So I, I, yeah, I think it's just a, it's, I'm not going to make a value judgment on what the president believes 100% about cutting, so if he's you know, 100% behind cutting Social Security and Medicare, I think he's trying to foster uh, a debate and a compromise here, and, and that's, that's where he is. And I, like I said, I, I'm not in a position to say what he truly believes in his heart about those programs. Right. But what's interesting about this budget is that it's not even one to one. I mean, he's proposing uh, a huge amount of cuts, but only asking for five hundred and eighty billion dollars in new revenue. So more than a one trillion dollars in additional spending cuts and only five hundred and eighty billion in new revenue. That's not even one to one. Right, and it's not an ideal budget. And I want to be clear. It's a, I don't. I don't. I don't know anyone who's arguing that it's an ideal budget uh, from a from a democratic or a left uh, progressive perspective. It's you know I think people realize that there needs to be more revenue in these talks and there needs to be uh, less focus on spending cuts at a time when we we should frankly be more focused on job growth and, and reducing unemployment and, and boosting the economy out of uh, fully out of the throes of the recession. So it's, Which by know, the way is uh, what Jack Lou has recently gone over to Europe to argue to the Europeans that they have actually pursued an austerity. Uh, agenda and have uh, created a, a double dip recession in Europe that's having a backlash here in America, and yet he makes that message in Europe but says something different in the United States because what the president's budget represents is an austerity agenda for the United States. Yeah, I, I think you know it, it's it's one thing to look at over at Europe and look at where we are, and I think we're going down. We've we've headed down that path. We've been talking about growing the economy and, and we know what we we could do to grow the economy and it's not something that's focused on uh, totally on deficit reduction um i do think the president's budget does it, it does include uh, some stimulus spending and some things that would would help boost the economy it does, does. It do enough it, it's not enough compared to previous offers it's it's not enough uh, compared to what we might actually need but i think you have to look at this budget in the context of what President Obama is trying to do, and that, and that doesn't make it an ideal. It doesn't make it necessarily a great plan. But they have been very clear that they're not shooting for an ideal. They're shooting for a compromise, a compromise that, frankly, probably isn't going to happen. I think we all know that. Uh, I think they probably even know that. So but that why is, that why is put what they're n- going for. not only put yourself out on that on the plank, but also put Democrats who actually have to go back to election in 2014 on the plank? Making them walk the plank on this. On which part? On the social on, on security, social security yeah, because as you well know, social security doesn't contribute to the uh, on budget deficit and can't by law. And so, um, right. you know, the fact that he's even offering this as a part of a deficit reduction deal is crazy. Right, and, and I think you know, I want to clarify one point that was made earlier about uh, about the Center for American Progress stand on on same CPI yes. and. I, I don't speak you know, for the center as a whole. I work for Think Progress in the blog, so it's, okay. it's, I'm not in on the development of the econ plans and whatnot. But uh, the when CAP has, in, has included chain CPI in previous proposals, it has been done as a more comprehensive Social Security reform package that right. also includes a more progressive structure on the payroll tax and increased benefits at the bottom Mm -hmm. of the income side and for the oldest uh, Social Security recipients. And it also includes... It's not an apples comparison to say that that, uh, CAP and even some of these other organizations have supported 
maintain CPI as it is included in the budget. Right Actually, now. I mean, the fact that a benefit cut is included as a part of, of the plan is, is interesting. Uh, the, the plan offered by the Center for American Progress. On top of that, as a part of that package you, you uh, talk about, is uh, the Center for American Progress's uh, willingness to actually invest 25% of the Social Security trust funds on Wall Street, uh, to put it in stocks offered and in, 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 in on Wall Street. Uh, and so, you know, the cuts combined with a more market exposure for the Social Security trust funds, is that where the Center for American Progress stands? I, I'm not going to speak for a cap as a whole. I, like I yeah. said, I I don't develop those plans. I I, I work for the for the Think Progress. Just the just so you know, out. I am actually friends with Christian Weller, the person who actually does develop those plans. So you know, I'm happy to have this conversation with him at a later time. But thank you for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. But before I let you go, I understand you're from Kentucky, and I would be remiss I if I did not ask you uh, about the brouhaha uh, around the Senate seat there. I wrote a, pu a piece for the Huffington Post uh, a couple of weeks ago asking Ashley Judd to reconsider, and since that time, we've actually found uh, news uh, out news that uh, indeed uh, that the um, uh, that the Republicans were planning to lampoon her, uh, her quote unquote mental health issues, rumored mental health issues. What do you think about what's going to happen there? Um, I, Ashley Judd, as a, as a Senate candidate in Kentucky, would have, would have been a very interesting dynamic. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am not 100% familiar with, with what's going on in the race. I, but I, I think, you know, Ashley Judd would have forced Mitch McConnell to spend uh, in the in the National Republican Senatorial Committee to uh, spend a lot of money in, yeah. in a race where they they aren't accustomed to spending a lot of money yeah. and I think on on this side uh, you know with without her in the race now you they're still kind of searching for a candidate and I think the what is uh, what we saw with this uh, video this audio that leaked from the McConnell campaign this week is. It's kind of emblematic of the problems that someone like Ashley Judd could have caused for mm -hmm. McConnell in the sense that, you know, she she has some things that, that they were going to attack her for, but she also, uh, those are things that we've seen the Republicans have been vulnerable on at times, but yeah. with the hot aching moments and the, you know, things where they, they, they haven't been very good about discussing uh, women's issues and the sensitivities that are around right. them, and it could have been interesting. I, I, I don't think you're going to get your wish. Uh, no, I don't think so either. But, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, I think it could still turn out to be an interesting race uh, if it, if they can coalesce a candidate that can maybe present some of the same issues and, and in the same manners that Ashley Judd might have. Right. Travis Waldron, thank you very much. Think progress. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Gaius Publius, uh, a very uh, innovative thinker on these issues of politics and policy. He is the contributing editor at America Blog. Uh, where he writes uh, daily, I think, uh, on issues regarding uh, the politics of Social Security, Medicare, and other issues. Are you with us, Gaius? I am, yes. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Maya. So you've been saying that a cut is a cut is a cut. That, you know, the as you well know, the White House has been calling uh, the chain CPI proposal a superlative CPI. Uh, they even um, were trying to sell it in their budget. Uh, the fact sheet, I think, talks about how the superlative CPI uh, protects uh, protects vulnerable populations. So tell me about how you should, how anybody out there listening to us uh, should define what a benefit cut is uh, and, and call a spade a spade, if you will. Well, the, the, you, you, we have to recognize that the goal if we look over the last two years uh, or longer, the goal is to find some way to cut some of the one of the big three programs somehow, just to begin the rollback. And it has to be a Democrat that does it, because uh, otherwise, if a Republican does it, uh, the Democrats will be up in arms. If a Democrat does it, maybe he can um, finesse Democratic support for it. So. We've seen over the last couple of years proposals like raising the retirement age of Social Security, raising the Medicare um, Part B premium, and I, it occurred to me that, that these are all proxies for the others. As you say, a cut is a cut is a cut. So I worked with uh, Daniel Marins, who is a producer at your radio station, by the way, mm -hmm. to try to define what are the seven windows into the hen house, what are the seven aspects of our border, where, what are we protecting so that we can see them all at the same time? Mm -hmm. 
And, and can you give us a short bullet of what those seven are? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Social Security, the, 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 the crown jewel will be raising the retirement age if they can do that, because that kicks people off the program. Which has huge race and class uh, implications, but oh, go ahead. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, yes, and it will kill people. Yeah, um, literally. Change, it literally is right. Chain CPI, which you've been discussing admirably, the, the nation has been discussing lately, because that's the one on the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, means testing benefits, Social Security right now is not means tested. Mm-hmm. So if you start means testing benefits, that starts the rollback, because mm-hmm. then you can say, but it's welfare, let's decide who's really deserving. Right. So those are the three attacks on Social Security. Okay. Retirement age, chain CPI, means test. Well, it seems like with the president's budget, he's very eager to be that Democrat who actually leads uh, who actually leads us down this uh, primrose path, if you will, to uh, cutting uh, the New Deal and Great Society legacy. Uh, and, in fact, he's actually uh, talked about it uh, with Republicans, saying that they need him. I recall a political Politico argument, uh, uh, article not too long ago uh, where the president told a Democrat, uh, president told a Republican that they're going to need him to get cuts uh, to quote unquote entitlement programs. So he actually wants to take this on, yet I can't figure out the politics because it's political suicide for the Democrats. Do you have any theories? Oh, absolutely. It, uh, the theory is it's not political suicide for Obama because he'll never face another election. He can do the billionaire bidding in his party, the Robert Rubin bidding, and he goes on to Bill Clinton's speaking fees when he gets out of out of office. So it's a win-win-win for him. So it endears him to the Wall Street crowd. Oh, well, it's not just the Wall Street crowd. It's that, it's that sweet spot where all billionaires, left-wing and right-wing, agree. We need more money. We need these trade deals. We should keep enriching ourselves. Mm-hmm. Factories should go to China. And to do that, we need to teach people that they need to live less well and that that's the new reality of the new world. We saw that in his 2006 Hamilton Project speech. We also saw it in his 2013 inaugural address. President Obama doesn't have to run again, though, but the House Democrats, who are currently in the minority, have to run again in 2014. What possible interest would they have in supporting this agenda? Well, it's that you know this is this is one of the most fascinating aspects of this uh, little moment in time we're living with. The uh, the House has been House progressives have been to this point fairly easy to wrangle when they needed the when the neoliberals like Steny Hoyer needed the votes. Mm-hmm. They've been able to roll the most enough of the progressives to get their bad bills passed. This time, I think the Democrats are waking up to, hey, this could be my last year in office. <laughs> I don't know if I'm, I'm, there's going to be enough K Street jobs for me in January of 2015. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, out of work people looking for those jobs. Well, the you're saying that because it. you're saying that because um, the progressive left is threatening the primary Democrats who vote for cuts to Social Security and Medicare uh, as a part of a grand bargain. Is that why you're saying that? I'm, <clears throat> that's part of it. But even if they don't get primaried, the Democrats could lose to Repo- anybody who comes out for benefit cuts in a district that's not strong red or strong blue, that's a little bit of a purple district one way or the other, is vulnerable to the other party running against him. So, so it doesn't take a primary. I, if, if I've got a Democrat who's an incumbent and I'm a Republican and it's in a, like a 52-48 divide, you know, Obama district, I'm going to, I'm going to finger him as a benefit cutter. So and president, I'm going to get a big bump on that. President eager to please, otherwise known as President Obama, uh, is offering uh, up more uh, cuts in terms of cuts to Social Security and Medicare. So, uh, you know, the, the going theory out there is that so that he can entice Republicans uh, to the table to do a deal on a grand bargain uh, that includes some increased revenue. Uh, however, how did Republicans respond this week? We saw them actually what? Well, we saw uh, John Boehner saying, hey, this is a great deal for us because he represents the, the, uh, A, a safe seat, he thinks, though we can talk about that, Mm -hmm. and B, he represents, he's doing the the bidding of his billionaires. But out in in the districts, people like Greg Walden, who runs for a Republican from Oregon and is also responsible for electing House Republicans this cycle, Mm -hmm. is saying, hey, 
I am, I'm shocked that President Obama would do this, and I think every Republican needs to run against Obama by running against chain CPI. So Republicans are actually positioning themselves as the defender of Social Security against a sitting Democratic president who's offered to cut Social Security. Who knew they would do that? Who knew that they would do that? Isn't that amazing? And the yeah, DCCC, really. how do they respond? Well, they're kind of on the hook, aren't they? I'm kind of waiting for Steve Israel and Debbie Wasserman Schultz to make statements of support or, or opposition. So far, they're silent, but there's not there's a there's a lot of noise being raised by actual um, actual people who are who are going to be up for re-election, as everybody is. So what, the DCCC you know, is is defending this chain CPI proposal, or are they against it? Um, I can't imagine they are opposed to it. Yeah. Simply because Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi, side by side, said during lame duck season that any deal that Obama and Boehner came up with, they would whip for. And at that time, uh, raising Medicare uh, eligibility age was one of the parts of the deal they were angling for. Yeah. So you know their support. They're just not getting caught with their with with sort of quotes hanging around their neck these days. Well, interestingly enough, uh, both Steny Hoyer uh, and Nancy Pelosi and uh, the House leadership actually um, uh, came out this week after a big Democratic caucus debate uh, between uh, experts on each side of this issue. Uh, and they sounded like they were tamping down uh, their gung-ho support for some kind of grand bargain deal. So it'll be interesting to see if progressives keep up the pressure, if the progressive caucus actually stands for what they believe in in terms and translate that into votes in the U.S. House, uh, that we could actually beat off some kind of uh, grand bargain deal. Uh, do you think that that's in the future? Oh, absolutely. We're, we're winning, and we're winning because, A, this really is toxic, B, Voters really, really get it, and see, we've got easily a third of, or more of the Republican caucus on our side. We just haven't done that reach across the aisle that we need to do for that. That statement of uh, Hoyer's, I saw that statement also. That kind of tells me that he's got his finger in the wind and it's blowing very strong the wrong way. Right. So he's hedging his bet, which is a good thing. It, it means that we have real support out there. Well, what's interesting is a person like Hoyer and, and some other folks like him uh, have districts that don't support the positions that their members support. Uh, they have districts where uh, people are actually in favor of uh, Social Security and Medicare, and they don't believe in cuts to the programs, and yet their uh, members are actually in another place. So this is interesting. It's going to be interesting to see where people draw the line on this issue. Absolutely. A final question for you uh, that I'm very curious about uh, is is the notion of uh, this o Obama for America, or actually not even Obama for America now, I think it's called something else, OFA? Organizing for Organizing America. For it's been rebranded about four times. Yeah. Organizing for America. And I actually read somewhere or heard somewhere that they're actually um, trying to whip up their public support for the president's budget to the de detriment of seniors, orphans, disability, uh, people on disability. Is that true? Well, you know, I haven't heard the, the same reports, but I would mm -hmm. be shocked if they didn't because mm -hmm. in their founding statement, in their last rebranding, what, they're, what they say they're attempting to do is take Obama's agenda to the people. Mm -hmm. Well, we know what Obama's agenda is, and if that's their agenda, then it would make perfect sense that they're not going to... Obama for America slash organizing for America is not going to come out against the uh, president's budget. That just doesn't make any sense at all. Which means that people organizing for organizing for America may be organizing against their own interests. Well, let's, it, let's just say this um, whole process where Obama has drawn a bright line in the sand and said, you're with me or against me, is dividing an awful lot of people into one group camp or the other, and that includes the progressive activist community who have to decide. Gaius Publius, thank you so much for your insight. As always, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Maya, and thank you for your good work on this, too. Thank you. And uh, stay with us as we return to speak with Mark Ames and Yasha Levine about the hypocrisy of the far right uh, libertarian establishment. Uh, after the break, I'm your host, Maya Rocky Moore. This is Pivot Point, sponsored by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. This is John Bobhoff. You know me best as Bowser, formerly of the group Sha Na Na. And you know, when we were rocking and rolling all those years ago, I wasn't particularly worrying about my retirement or how I'd pay for health care. But now that I'm 65, I really understand the importance of Medicare. Not just for myself, but for generations of working Americans who need secure health care as they get older. 
That's why this election is so important. The Romney Ryan Coupon Care Plan will mean the end of traditional Medicare. It gives seniors a partial payment which loses value over time and raises our health care costs as much as $500 more each month. Coupon Care also puts us at the mercy of private insurers, making it harder to pick our own doctors. All of this to pay for tax cuts for the wealthy? Are you kidding me? Americans of all ages say no to coupon care. Bum 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 dang 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 ding a dong ding. Preserve Medicare. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Welcome back to Pivot Point. I am your host, uh, Dr. Maya Rockymore, and it is my pleasure to welcome Mark Ames. He's the founding editor of ExileOnline.com and senior editor at NFSWCorp.com, which stands for Not Safe for Work Corp. Uh, and also Yasha Levine, a staff writer for the ExileOnline.com and for NFSWCorp.com. And she's the author of the book, The Corruption of Malcolm Gladwell. So welcome, Yasha and Mark. Hello. Hello. Uh, Thanks for having us. Listen, you wrote an excellent article uh, this week in the nation. Well, actually, in the nation, it's an older article, but it's very yeah. relevant to our time right now. Uh, it talks about the Koch brothers and their interaction with a little-known economist called Friedrich Hayek. Can you tell us about that interaction? Um, uh, yeah, well, Hayek uh, is sort of the godfather of the libertarian slash neoliberal uh, free market economics, the modern version. He and he and, and uh, Milton Friedman are sort of the two main guys in the pantheon. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1974, I believe it was. Uh, the year before that, 1973, Charles Koch was just beginning to lay the foundations for this you know, vast libertarian think tank empire that he has today. And he wanted to bring out Hayek uh, to America from Germany in order to found what's now come to be known as the Austrian School of Economics and brand it and everything. Mm -hmm. And the problem is Hayek, who wrote, who wrote The Road to Serfdom in 1945 uh, and other books which argue that social programs invariably lead to gulags and concentration camps. Um, but, but Hayek in real life was terrified, as was, were revealed in these letters that Yasha discovered, in real life, Hayek was terrified of coming to America in his older age because there, wa there weren't the same programs that Austria, his native Austria, had. Uh, there weren't the same universal free health care programs, and there weren't the same uh, you know, pension programs. And so what he was arguing about in public was Social Security and Medicare lead to gulags, so, you know, and if you want your freedom, you have to give that up. In private, it turned out he was afraid to even come spend six months or a few weeks in America without universal health care. And if, in Charles fact, Koch, the, the Koch... Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. what's funny is Charles Koch wrote back and said, wait a minute, uh, Friedrich, you were a professor at the University of Chicago in the 50s. If you secretly were being a hypocrite and secretly paid into Social Security those 10 or 11 or 12 years you were at University of Chicago you are eligible when you return for Social Security and new Medicare benefits. And it turned out Hayek had secretly paid in. Mm -hmm. So both of them are just liars. And, you know, a few years later, Charles starts up the Cato Institute, and Cato is, is, takes credit for, and with, you know, with, for some reason, takes credit for starting the whole movement to privatize Social Security. They started it back in the late 70s. So on the one hand, you have uh, these uh, thinkers, these uh, you know uh, conservative thinkers, arguing publicly that these programs need to be dismantled, that they're a threat to freedom, and then privately saying, "Yeah, take advantage of them, use them personally," because this is you know this. The, what what really stunned me is that. Um, you know, uh, I just wondered why uh, Charles Koch, who is a very wealthy man and was at that time, uh, didn't offer uh, better benefits uh, through his institutes. Cheap. Well, they're all, <laughs> all the why. <laughs> the question is why. You know, it, it's already handled by the government. You know, I mean, and this is what you. This is. I mean, this, you know, I was. I spent. I spent most, countless hours actually in the in the in the, in the archives in um, 
Hayek's paper, digging around Hayek's papers at, at Stanford. That's where they're at the Hoover Institute. That's where they're housed now. And you know, the only so this, so here we have uh, you know conversation between Ch- Hayek and Koch, these two you know monumental figures in in the world of libertarianism and the world of, you know uh, and really responsible for you know a lot of the ideological and the uh, and the you know the money be- the ideology and the money behind the push to privatize and and, and, and for free market ideas. And the only interaction that we uh, I could find really between Charles Koch and Hayek, you know, was the, was Hayek telling? I mean, was Charles Koch telling Hayek to get on social to get on social security? And I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. And and and, and Hayek fact, telling him only, he's terrified of that, living okay. without it. Oh, what, repeat Go that. Ahead. Repeat that. I'm sorry. I was going to say, and Hayek telling Koch he's terrified of living <laughs> of spending one day in his life without social security and Medicare that he got in Austria. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and Charles Koch sending Hayek uh, a, a pamphlet on, on how he can take advantage of um, Social Security benefits, a, a Social Security government b- pamphlet that, you know, Charles Koch sent to Hayek. It's, I mean, it's, 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 you couldn't make this stuff up. So it's so funny. Remind, remind our listening audience uh, about who the Koch brothers are and what they funded. I think Tea Party is what people resonate with. Right, Tea Party. The the father um, founded uh, the John Birch Society back in in the early sixties, late fifties. Mm-hmm. They the sons Charles and David inherited the, uh, the the oil company and grew it. And today, the two brothers combined wealth is something like seventy five billion dollars. I, I mean, it's really Charles, and then Charles kind of uses his brother. So if you really just say Charles as well, so basically seventy five yeah. billion dollars. Mm-hmm. But that's their combined wealth. They um, run the largest private company uh, in America, their oil company, and um, they have funded, they're responsible not just for the Tea Party, that's a later version, but for the entire modern libertarian movement. They have funded, and libertarians say this openly as well, they have funded the entire movement up to today, but they also fund mainstream versions of that, like, you know, Paul Ryan and Michelle Bachman and Herman Cain and everybody who pushes for the most kind of Every, everybody who sort of pushed the bar further towards radical libertarianism, but they also backed Sam Brown back, for example. So mm-hmm. a lot of more traditional pro-war, uh, anti-abortion, uh, anti-gay um, conservatives as, as well. So to me, it's you know this is part of an ongoing. Uh kind of uh, hypocrisy on the far right uh, libertarian spectrum. Uh, Yasha, does the name Ann O'Connor mean anything to you? Or Mark? Either one of you? Ann O'Connor? What about Ayn Rand? Oh, of course. (laughs) Oh, no, I don't even know who, no, who is that? (laughs) So, you don't know who Ayn Rand is? I wish I didn't know. (laughs) (laughs) So, another professor, I mean, the the grandmother, if you will, of of this whole conservative establishment uh, against uh, the establishment of social insurance and everything else, uh, actually in her older and later years, uh, herself uh, took Social Security and Medicare right. under the name. As took her husband's name, O'Connor, took her hand, husband's in order to name. get Medicare and Social Security. That is right? correct. So that is yeah. another instance of hypocrisy yeah. of the well, first yeah. degree. Well, you know, it, it, speaking of hypocrisy and speaking of, you know, uh, the, the Cokes and the, the, the origins of their wealth, you know, we can, you know, we can really go back to the Soviet Union because their father, Fred Koch, I mean, really made... The, the first nut of the family uh, money that w- later on became Coke Industries uh, and the bi- founded the, the, the business that became Coke Industries, it came from the Soviet Union. You know, he worked, he built, um, you know, Stalin's oil infrastructure in the, in the 20s. You know, he was one of the American contractors who was chosen for that or who did, agreed to do it. And so in the, in, in, in the late 20s, he um, trained... Um, you know, Soviet uh, engineers, they came over to his compound to the, uh, in Wichita, Kansas, and uh, so he, he trained them, and then he built refineries all over the United, uh, the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and, and really, he, I mean, the contract, I think I'm trying to remember, it's, I think it was $5 million at the time. That was yeah, the, it was $5, company, it was $5 million. Contract, million dollars, $5 million dollars. He, was, he was wiped out in the 20s in the, uh, trying to compete in America. Um, yep. So he got this contract to build from Stalin to build uh, uh, 15 oil refineries along the Volga, and he later said when he wrote his his book about why you know basically when he was starting the John Birch Society he said it was it was because of his experience in the Soviet Union seeing uh, 
um, you know, what socialism can do, that he became an anti, such a hardcore anti-communist. But he didn't talk about really how that, that experience also is what seeded his entire business. I mean, well, $5 exactly. million dollars in 1933 was a lot of money. Well, yeah. Mark and Yasha, thank you for this a, a bit of investigative journalism. Uh, just one last question, uh, Mark. Uh, what, what do you think the implications are uh, of this kind of hypocrisy for moving forward? Any way that this can inform the larger conversation that we're now facing about the destruction of Social Security and Medicare? Um, yeah, you know, hypocrisy, it's, it, it's, it's not even hypocrisy. It's just a bait and switch. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a fraud. Right. I think it's better to say they're, they're just defrauding people. But how does that um, relate to what's going on now? Well, Obama uh, has, and, and the DNC have now decided that, that they are going to front Charles Koch's long-time dream of dismantling Social Security. Think about that, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I can't think of anything more horrible than that. I mean, right. I expect, um, and, and we pro- all probably expect, you know, uh, hypocrisy and, and bait and switches from, uh, from the Kochs and from the right-wing libertarians. Um, you know, Obama was backed by people. He won re-election by people who did not want this. Right. And what he's doing is something George Bush couldn't do because people were more focused on it, we, or, you know, or Reagan couldn't do. Right. He's going to be the guy to start the dismantling of Social Security right. and Medicare. And he seems and to be I proud to do it. Think about. Seems to be proud to do it, too. But thank you yep. so much, Mark and Yasha, for your excellent reporting. I hope to have you on again in the future. Thanks for having us on. Thank you for having us. Well, that's it for another edition of Pivot Point with Maya Rockymore. As always, I'd like to... Thank my listening audience, uh, my production team of Peter James Callahan and Simi Abru, and our sponsor, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Finally, I would like to remind our listening audience to join us live every Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on WeActRadio.com, 1480 a.m. if you're in Washington, D.C. Until next time, America. I didn't know that. Um, but also, I think I would rather do my piece in the context of talking to experts of color. So I would like next You're week listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us yeah. online at weactradio.com. Yeah. So. Round table of people of color yeah. talking about how Obama sold us out. Let's do that next week. Okay. And, and then I'll talk about my... Well, here's the top 20 bills on the Hill from Congress and from our friends at popvox.com. That's P-O-P-V-O-X dot com. The PopVox Weekly Bill Roundup for the week of February 1st through 7th. Well, it looks like this week we get a break. Americans are not being held by gunpoint, meaning not all bills this week are gun-related. However, with the new news this week that our government can use drones against us, We might be safer in our streets because of the new gun laws they're making, but can we say the same about the comfort of our own home? Looks like the blizzards in the Northeast are not the only snow job we're getting. Well, here we are, the top 20 bills. And remember, my views are my views on these bills, and I share them, but you don't have to hold them. Number 1. S-174. The Ammunition Background Check Act a bill to appropriately restrict sales of ammunition. Number two, H.R. 437, the assault weapon ban, to regulate assault weapons to ensure the right to keep and bear arms is not unlimited. Number three, S. 179, Gun Trafficking Prevention Act, a bill to prevent gun trafficking. I've said this before and I'll say it again. This bill is a little bit like saying that, uh, well, I guess dishonest people will go to honest methods to get their goods. I mean, how can you create a law for people who don't follow laws? 
Number four, S-150, the assault weapon ban. Number five, HR-367, the regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny Act, which is an acronym is RAINS. That's fun, like raining, you know. Here's what it is. It's to provide that major rules of the executive branch shall have no force or effect unless a joint resolution approval is enacted into the law. This one seems to be about not allowing the person to make a decision on their own. It needs to be voted on. I'm not sure, but I think that's the reason that we have our political system in trouble the way it is. Too many people can't make a decision on anything. I say the president was voted in, so let him do his work. Otherwise, politicians, you might find yourself on the president's list. The drone list? Checking it twice. Number six, common sense legislation to end gun violence. Maybe this bill, because it's been here so long, should be renamed, give me a cent every time someone says or does something dumb with a gun. Number seven, HR 444. They require presidential leadership and no deficit. It's called Require a Plan Act. This bill basically states that the president has to give his fiscal year 2014 budget. And if he doesn't achieve one, a balanced one, then he has to give a supplemental one. You know, here's a funny thing. What they should just do is hire a, a mother of three who's lost her job. Let her balance the budget. I can guarantee you she'll know how to get a dollar to stretch a lot further. Number 8, S46, the ensuring the full faith and credit of the U.S. and protecting American Soldiers and Seniors Act. I bet the Congress doesn't even know what that one means. I'd check popbox.com if I were you on that one. Number 9, H.R. 431, to restore certain authorities of the ATF to administer the firearms law. Number 10, H.R. 449, the Veterans Heritage Firearm Act. Number 11, S-82, the Separation of Powers, Restoration, and Second Amendment Protection Act. A bill to provide that any executive action infringing on the Second Amendment has no force or effect. Let me see if I have this right. We want our government 